hypothermia is when your core temperature drops mm. below a level where you can regain independently where your own body can generate enough heat to re regain a uh, homeostasis. Okay. At a lower place. You just, you've fallen out of the range where you can warm yourself up back to, um, oh. so, so without external, external heat in, external intervention, you're, you're mm. dead. You're yep, dead. Whether you realize just, yeah. it or not, like even if you know that that's happening, oh, I'm shit, I'm too cold. You, mm -hmm. Unless you can find external heat, you're going to die. No recovery? No. Mm -hmm. or independent but it's peaceful. <laughs> somewhere else. Yeah. 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 As a kid, Zen. I was mocked people that would have, you know, extra Actually, that's stuff a good in metaphor. the trunk <laughs> for trauma. Mm -hmm. You reach a point of so much arousal or overwhelm or flooding that there's no recovery unless you have somebody else hold space or guide you out of it. Except our society blames the victim, <laughs> <laughs> distracting the trauma survivor, having to pretend play like everything's okay. And that yeah, frozen bring... state, the trauma state stays frozen, just like hypothermia. We bring the wrong blankets, yeah. Not, we're not, yeah. I I'm really self-blame. Yeah. I absolutely self-blame when I, when I get to that point. And um, I absolutely, mm. it's like the biggest shame or shame. Well, that might be a way of trying to warm yourself up. <laughs> so you're functional, but you're a zombie. You never yes. get to homeostasis until you have somebody else uh, guide you back into your normal uh, warmth level. Mm-hmm. Mm yeah. A bit like hypervigilance, eh? <laughs> you can't get back. Well, you might be in hypervigilance because you realize you're frozen and you're not resilient anymore. Yeah, you, you realize you your nervous system is shot. You can't so you force have to yourself use out. Use extra yeah. energy. You have to force yourself to just that. to function. Hmm. Sounds good. Because that's the extreme free state. Ooh. That's what the chart says. So you get to the free state. So you can call it freeze. <laughs> but if you try to go, go back into the fight or flight, <laughs> other people will, will dump their freeze on you. Like, oh, scapegoat, I can dump trauma on. <laughs> Then you're hanging out here in this immobilized thing. And look, your heart rate decreases, blood pressure, temperature, all these things are similar to hypothermia. You guys didn't yeah. see that. Really it's the same. Potential link. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Good one, D. <laughs> well, you guys came up with it. So. I was like, oh. How are we starting this connection. meeting talking about death of from hypothermia? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, starting off with pleasant discussions. Winter is coming. See the meeting with that. Careful. Yeah, <laughs> got to get the winter kit in the car. Do we have a working definition of what's trauma? Or is trauma essentially saying something? I'm offended. I'm hurt. I don't like it. Therefore, I'll call it trauma. Makes me feel uncomfortable, I'll call it trauma. Makes me whatever. So we can use Dan Siegel's definition, which might be incomplete in my opinion. And the simplest way of defining trauma is it's an experience we have that overwhelms our capacity to cope. An experience for one person may not be traumatizing to another. Okay, he defined it this way. An experience we have... Defining trauma is it's an experience we have that overwhelms our capacity to cope. <laughs> that could be little t or big t. As Claudia, uh, Claudia B said, <laughs> you could have small trauma or big traumas, but if you were to simplify all traumas as anything 
that happens to any one person individually that overwhelms their ability to cope. Ability to cope. An experience. So that means everyone who's been born to birth has been traumatized multiple times. Because you aren't born with a list of coping strategies that you would tackle every single stressor in life. So this definition makes trauma totally worthless because it's a human condition. But let's see if he adds anything more. For one person may not be traumatizing to another. If I were a race car driver and they're constantly getting hit and flipped over. If the race car is constantly flipping over, he's probably not going to be a race car driver very long. <laughs> Unless it's a demolition. But yes, they're constantly getting hit a little, but flipping over, that would be an exaggeration. But a race car driver would be more skilled at driving high speed and getting hit. Yes. Over. So then if I was driving, you know, and my car got hit in a, you know, in a highway and I flipped over, I mean... <laughs> so if you were a race car driver and you had the experience of flying around on the road, then you got hit by a semi and you flipped over, then... You're not traumatized. Used to what to do, right? Whereas if you were driving and that would happen, of course it would be traumatizing. It It would be traumatizing if you weren't a race car driver because you didn't get flipped over around time. So automatically, everyone else would be traumatized because you couldn't cope with the idea that an oil tanker flipped you over. How do you cope with the idea an oil tanker has flipped your car over and over and over again? For the brain to cope with the situation, it needs to take in stimuli that are coming in from the outside world. All of that input is based... Okay, that's a different angle. We'll, no. <laughs> we'll take a break at this coping thing. How many people have car accidents? How many people have car accidents where the car flips over or turns around or 360s, fishtails, stuff like that? How many people were able to cope and don't call that traumatic? I've had a car do 360 in the snow on interstate. I've had a car... I didn't flip over, but I hit another car, and the other car flipped over. <laughs> and then it spun around. And that case is over, so I think there's a legal thing or that's covered. Maybe I'll have to take that out of the audio or the video. <laughs> so the brain doesn't have to cope, I would argue. It's not about the brain that's coping. You just Your map of the world just has to be stable afterwards. Say, this isn't really the best example, but the start of it, saying trauma is something that overwhelms your ability to cope, I would say that's one element, but that's not it. it needs to be more, and we'll get to that in a minute. It needs to take in stimuli that are... So the way to heal from trauma, this is better, I'll agree with this part. So you need to take in stimuli from the outside world coming in from the outside world all of that input is basically energy and information flow through the nervous system and then it has to take it and do something with it and if you think of therapy so you have to take in information you have to be able to make sense of it you have to understand it you have to have sense making that's what i was trying to ask tina but she just said oh i have i have good sense making just because i say it even though she couldn't explain so I, in a way that I could make sense of what her trauma was and abuse and all the other stuff. But you need to take in stuff so you can integrate it in your mind, you can articulate it, that's sense making. And then in therapy, what do you do? As a way you change the brain, it's a reasonable statement to say the purpose of therapy for trauma is to create more integration in your client's brain. Treating trauma is a complicated... The purpose of therapy for trauma is to create more integration in your client's brain. So if you were to label trauma as a disintegrated, fragmented brain because of excess, overwhelming uh, experiences that killed your ability to cope, slowly your brain would be fragmented, disintegrated, all over the place, uncoordinated. 
that would be closer to PTSD or CPTSD. But just getting overwhelmed, no one cares. Any objections? Anyone who's traumatized by my challenging of Dan Siegel? Is that overwhelming someone's ability to cope that I am saying something different from the expert? Some people could say that's traumatic. How can I <laughs> and somebody else have a different point of view? That's not allowed. Some people would cry like safe space. How can there be two different opinions? No reactions. Yeah, today's kind of chill. Yeah, well, that's like the whole vaccine thing going on. You're not, you're not like to <laughs> disagree, are you? You'll get crucified. Vaccine. We're going to argue about the conspiracy from the deep state. <laughs> Let's do this. Adam's like, nope. <laughs> I've got my ideas all squared away. I'm good. I'm not going to argue any of that. All to do with Nigeria. It starts in Nigeria. You guys don't know about it. It's a real deep state. <laughs> oh, fuck. Nigeria is the real deep state. <laughs> I think it's Switzerland. So talking about trauma is tricky because we've been trained to just digest uh, norms of how to deal with trauma and even the experts of trauma are sort of vague on how to deal with it so this sort of gives you an idea of the tricky territory of trauma navigating trauma asking people tell me your trauma story which I hear people do is really um, a very naive notion about trauma because trauma is overwhelming So now they've turned trauma to say overwhelming equals trauma. Trauma equals overwhelming. Well, anything can be overwhelming or flooding or whatnot. If I might propose a, a simpler definition where trauma is deeper, longer lasting damage, because you can have emotional trauma um, by some sort of catastrophic abuse. You can have physical trauma right? If you stand next to an IED when it explodes, like a scratch or a splinter, that's not trauma. That's not physical trauma. That's a, a, a superficial injury. And when you're mm -hmm. at the grocery store and somebody says, I don't like your hat. Well, that's also kind of a superficial inju injury. But if, if there's deeper, yeah, if longer I spent my whole injury, life making that hat and it's my whole identity, it could be traumatic to me. Well, then you have other problems to address if that's your whole identity. I probably do, yeah. But I'll, I'm happy to say it's all trauma instead of deal with the other stuff. <laughs> now, where that line is, you know, yes, that's between the superficial definition. and longer lasting, that's, people will define that line differently. But to me, that's the distinction. So longer lasting. Deeper. Longer lasting uh, and deeper. Issue, but it could be mislabeled like what we discussed last week, the labeling to have a shared language and someone could just have trauma because, you know, the wine glass is different that, that, that they ordered. And that's the end of the wedding, you know, um, traumatized. And some people have had actual loss of limbs and they're not as traumatized. Long well, time. it's 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 I don't think you can argue that would be phys physically traumatizing if you lost a limb. I, I don't think there's many people who would disagree with that. For some people, it could be emotionally traumatizing and maybe for others it wouldn't be. But. Again, there's a, there's a line between, you know, superficial damage and something that's going to be deeper. And longer lasting. So the time frame of recovery, which is, I think, is actually in the PTSD uh, DSM definition. How long it lasts after a certain period of time. That'd be where PTSD has a, a line. Robbie. So if my, if my wife, or soon to be ex-wife, we were having on our first kid, Patrick. And the moment he was born um, and thereafter, 
when my mother, my soon-to-be ex-mother-in-law came into the birthing room. Ex-mother, birthing room. And, and she said to my wife and me, look, I told you. I told you you should have had an abortion. I told you you should have had an abortion. That, In the birthing me, room? Yes. <laughs> Yelling at the at the daughter or daughter-in-law? Yep. Was the pregnancy going normal or that was just a way to, to not welcome, reject the upcoming baby? <laughs> that or the was grandchild? Her, that was her interjecting herself into our life. Mm -hmm. Well, shaming. Rejecting. Shaming. I told you you should have had an abortion. Or, yeah. Right. Instead of welcoming me the baby into the world. Yeah, she did the opposite. She did a rejection. That, I don't want you. And to me, that that was a very traumatizing thing for me to have I witnessed is to have my soon-to-be ex-mother-in-law tell us, see, I told you you should have had an abortion. I told you you should have had an abortion. So that's... Uh, so that'd be the... Uh, that be yeah your your wife's uh, mother, mother was yelling at her daughter, so yes. blood on blood, and yep, that I was emotionally traumatizing to you. I could see, yeah, and then, it was based on Jeff's add-on of saying deeper and longer-lasting damage. Absolutely, because now my son is twenty-five years old, and he's a recovering alcoholic. And um, he tried to kill himself a couple times already. And he put on his Facebook page, um, look, I'm not worthy of living. And um, because I'm not worthy of living, I should have never been born. born. And um, uh, I should have never been born. He's actually yes. saying uh, his and, rejection um, <laughs> message. That, that stems from my soon-to-be ex-mother-in-law implementing that over the years of telling him that. Told oh. you should have. So she continued to repeat this message to, yes, exactly. to, to her grandson or your son. And now yes. he's he's traumatized as he's owned that unwanted identity. So, right? And so now, now I'm traumatized as a result of that because she said it to my son and hurt my son. So it's deeper and longer lasting damage. Yes. Over the 25 years that he's alive, she's repeatedly said this to him. It was but, to us as well. So it's missing the injury part. Because as a baby, he's not going to understand it. Right. He doesn't I'm understand guessing. it. Yeah. But over, over the years, if she keeps repeating it, then right. maybe it could exactly. be a psychological injury. It's a repeated thing. Yeah. But the bigger issue is that he, he believes he's broken, right? Yes, correct. And he's self-exiling, or he feels like he's been exiled by his grand grandmother, repeatedly right. saying, I don't want you, you're a loser, or whatever, however she's framing it. So the trauma mm -hmm. is lingering more because he believes he's broken and he feels exiled, or other people have exiled him. The yes. injury is what we all focus on. How dare, how dare, uh, your mother-in-law go into the pregnancy room and say, you're not welcome. That's injury, right? Yes. But the lingering yes. part is that he believes he's broken and he's had repeated messages of he, we don't want you, you're a loser, what Harper has been praying, right? And to me now, I, I think about it. I think that's part of her projection. Part of her projection. Her, okay. Part of her onto us. Maybe she shouldn't have been born. Mm, mm. Yeah. What do, what do you think about that? Uh, okay, let's go with it. Let's say it's true. Yeah. Let's agree with that. I'm happy to explore. So how do we heal the trauma now? 
She that wants he's... to have not been born, but she's still living. We can't unborn her. <laughs> he tried. <laughs> she tried to dump the unborn energy to her her grandson, and the grandson has suicidal drive, but that's not unborn yet. So, do we need to find someone to unborn, and then everything's ha- copacetic, or what do we do? How do we heal this type of trauma? positive reinforcement that he is worth that. Yeah, but can you give so much positive reinforcement to counter hatred of being born? That's a very good question. Yeah. If you're just trying to displace, hatred destroys boundaries. That's why hatred is such a strong uh, tool. Yeah. So, you can't love a destroyed, something destroyed by hatred like this. Hatred is a sign of the complete loss of your boundaries in the presence of someone who is living out your shadow. Your boundaries are gone. Hatred is a sign of the complete loss of your boundaries in the pre- So she's destroying everyone's boundaries because she has Correct. a hatred of her life being born using this theory. We don't know for sure. So she's dumping that pain using hatred which forces the toxic dump. Let's assume it onto the grandson. If you tried to go put love into the toxic dump of this pure hatred of life un- wanting to become unborn, there's no amount of love you're going to be able to give that's going to displace the hatred. Yeah, that's what I have a hard time comprehending. See? That's really, that's really hard for me to hear that. Well, the issue is that he believes he's broken and exiled. That's more of the issue. <laughs> If you tell him that he's loved and he's been told by somebody else that he's broken, the broken message is going to stick better than you saying that he's loved. He has to come to a conclusion to realize that he's not broken or exiled. That's the challenge. To each his own. It's plain to see. He needs to find his own self to identify his worthiness to himself. His own moral compass. Eventually having a moral compass and moral, repairing his moral injury. But right now he's outsourced his worth <laughs> to the grandmother and everyone else. So if he's, if he's outsourced his worth to the grandmother, and then you tried to replace that outsource identity with your love and whatnot, the grandmother had more hate, so you can't... The hate's going to win. Because the problem is, you, he's been, he's outsourced his self-esteem, he's outsourced his sense of his soul, his spiritual value. That's partially why, like first step of, uh, first or second step of twelve step, recognize there's a greater power, higher power. First step, and then the higher power is one that loves you. The, the higher power repairs the exile, repairs the brokenness, or the group. So you could have the 12-step group that repairs brokenness. But one person, or humans, most likely cannot repair hatred, suicidal tech drive. It's like uh, outsourcing the examination. Ex- examining something is being outsourced. So if, if, but if you yeah, can't that's good. do yeah. the examination yourself to re-examine what the hell the bit says then uh, you, you, you can't own it. You're only, and if you don't have the skill to examine because of all the bullshit you've been taught from mass media and stuff, then, then you, you can go into a loop and not get out of it. That is just so fucking sad. Yeah. That fucking sucks because... <laughs> it yeah, sucks. You know, because... you know you're in a, um, uh, what might call a uh, no wonderland. It's like... Um, there's no anchor to anything, and then you're just going to spin. Yeah, that's the way it's been for 10 years now. Is, is that when you learned about your what your mother-in-law had been oh. telling your son 10 years yeah. ago? When he was about 15? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I was curious when about that timeline. Yeah, that was... That was 2015, to be precise. 
Hey, Robbie. Yes. Sorry, when you, uh, your mother-in-law first said that, was it based on any reason or just making shit up? No, my my son was born with a... Um, oh, Cliff, sorry, I missed it. I wasn't... Uh, no, it, he was born with a cleft lip. It was very minor in nature. Mm -hmm. and very, it, it was surgically repaired, you know, in about three weeks. Oh, and it was so repaired. Just, yeah. It, it was a minor cleft lip. Our youngest son, Nicholas, has had um, 54 surgeries, and he had a bilateral cleft lip and cleft palate. And she didn't say anything about him at that moment that he was born. But okay. she did say that to, to my wife and me both, uh, that we should never have kids ever again. The shaming, the guilt... Um, and I've had to work through that for the through the years. Oh. So, you've had to work through that. If we were to take away the the narrative, and this is a bit abstract, but it's part of the theme. Um, if her goal was to outsource her toxic shame and get other people to feel it and work through it, was she successful? Absolutely, she was successful on me and everybody else. See? And then if you fixate on a moral judgment of how outrageous what she said or did, you end up feeling the toxic shame that she wanted someone else to feel for you, for her. Yeah. I did. Yes. So... The approach of looking at the flaw and giving her all the power of breaking you and her grandson. What if that's just a shell game to get you to feel the toxic shame and get the grandson to feel the toxic shame and maybe try to act out her desire to be unborn, what she said, say that theory. Okay. And she's still winning because the narrative is you've given up your power or I'm adding this narrative, because you're acting out her toxic shame. You've given up your power to her because you've fallen to her story. You've taken, or your son has taken on the unwanted identity, and you've taken on the identity of uh, uh, how dare her, you're helpless, and blah, blah, blah. Right. And then you also have to go work on yourself, so you have to work on yourself because she broke you. Yes. What if you've never been broken? Uh, boom. We'll try to, by nine, we'll try to give an argument. So no need to take it oh, in now. Still be yeah, skeptical. This is a hard sell. Yes, it is. That's why I wanted to give up at the beginning of the meeting. But since I already started, we'll try. <laughs> but this is <laughs> really counter you know, what's out uh, there. <laughs> Robbie, the bastard in me just comes up with shit like this that oh you do a test on her your mother-in-law and say oh you should have never been born because it's all because of you you fucking bitch See, that's oh, yeah. one way of trying to get it back to her that's exactly what i was saying at the time that's exactly how i felt at the time too it's like fuck yes you, bitch. but she <laughs> wore you down because she kept repeating it over and over and over again because she had stronger hate the stronger hate will eventually win. Yeah, because your your littles don't own it as her littles do, so she's gonna win. That's how I'm feeling it. So you build, still implicitly believe what she says, and how dare you? Instead of saying no, I, I'll just hit you out of the ballpark. So what happened was evaluation got stolen. That's what Pankaj was saying, and. That's the down, or that's the injury of narcissism. It's not exactly today's theme, but it might fit. <laughs> this is a, a simplification. He takes over your mind, so the narcissist becomes your reality test. You you want to orient yourself in reality, and so you you refer to the narcissist. He yeah. becomes your reference point. Right. He becomes your your world. You and he begins to fulfill your ego boundary functions. Mm. So. 
uh, your sense of self-worth becomes critically dependent on him. Your reality testing, all the functions that the ego performs mm. are now performed by the narcissist because he had become a part of your ego. He had insinuated you so. And this creates in you a feeling of an external locus of control. Mm. You do begin to feel like a puppet, mm. a, mar a marionette with strings, you know? Mm. You begin to feel hollowed out. You begin to feel you know, that you're mustered somehow. Yeah. From the, from the outside, an external locus of control, and this is the process that we described as entraining. So the narcissist becomes your reality test. It yeah. becomes your reference point. So trauma starts as an overwhelming injury of some sort, deeper, longer lasting. But the longer lasting part, I would argue, is because it becomes an identity, or it becomes you, where you're broken and exiled. That's the tricky part. Or you give away your agency to let your mother define what happened and who's broken, and then you take on the negative identity where you want to disprove the mother. Or you want to hate her back. You want to get even because she caused an injury. But then you're chasing. And if you're chasing, you're usually losing because the principle of least interest is if the person who's least interested is the one who's losing, the one who's chasing, the one who's accepted the broken, exiled, un unwanted identity. Because the so you have an injury of trauma, and then the other part of the trauma is they steal your voice. Your voice gets stolen, or you lose the capacity to articulate your pain. That's part of what. Ken Hardy was trying to say with this. We walk around with all this unnamed pain that organize our lives in ways that makes it difficult for us to know why we do what we do. So this assaulted sense of self is what happens to one's self uh, when one's self has been traumatized. It's very difficult to define or develop a clear sense of who one is. So if your son got this unwanted identity as sense of self assaulted, where he wasn't welcome, he was rejected. And that just got repeated to him with tons of hate from the grandmother. Then he's not, because he's getting flooded by hate and judgment, he doesn't have the in intellect and the verbal skills to articulate his voice, to find himself, maybe to even develop a separate sense of self. If we focus on the injure, the injurer, the trauma, the trauma is just a doorway. It's a doorway to access brainwashing. It's a doorway to cause the long-term broken and exiled identity. This part. To heal the trauma, we, we acknowledged who did it and all that stuff, but, but agency, Self-agency, critical thinking, internal locus of control, that's what's missing. That's partially why I was keying in on Liam talking about agency and I was like, oh. <laughs> him deluding himself to say, oh, okay, maybe I'm socialized by the system, but because the system gives me choices, I have agency. Because in my agency illusion, I have agency. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, that'll fuck you up if you have that opinion in the world. You're just opening yourself for more trauma with that kind of thought process. If you lose your voice and you dismiss losing your voice, then you've already bought into your broken exiled and you have no hope. You just... Yes, trauma is more like having a sense of, or actually having lost some primal agency. Lost some primal agency, yeah. Maybe we'll get to that, yeah. Adam. Yeah, this idea kind of hits on like a definition of trauma. I've heard that like something that's like intense becomes traumatic if you are like helpless in the situation. So like a child being abused 
it's like helpless to like either stand up to verbal abuse or physical or something else. And that's like a factor that can make it traumatic. So the helplessness, I like that extra factor. Yeah. I have a story to back up Adam's point, if I may. So uh, I got, I was at a cash machine and a heroin addict with a syringe full of blood tried to rob me and the syringe is here, so that's not the best. But I Tai Chi'd my way out of it uh -huh. within a second, addict. held up my skateboard like I'm going to crack you in the head. A few weeks later, I met my friend and his girlfriend in the street and the same thing had happened to her. She'd be robbed at a cash point by a guy with a syringe. Mm -hmm. And she was traumatized. She she had to give him money. It took minutes. And she was even talking about it. She was like crap, you know, like almost like flashing up. up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And she, so I mean that was very different because I had in that moment, I guess, an agency or like You stood up for yourself or you thought you stood up for yourself. And got got out of yeah, you, yeah like, and you survived to somehow and got mm -hmm. out of the situation. Yeah. Where she had a similar situation, but she didn't have presence of mind or ability to fight back in her view. Yeah, she's maybe blaming herself as well. So then she's blaming herself after the fact. And then she's telling you the story and she's looping and looping and looping. Because she came to the conclusion that she's broken. And she hasn't figured out how to uh, get unbroken. That's the challenge. So if you have a trauma, you feel helpless, it creates a sense of being broken or exiled. If you can find someone to help you get unbroken or get reborn as a new life, so you can regain your agency or regain your voice, then maybe that's the missing element of trauma, of healing from trauma. Welcome, Kurt. We're diving into trauma. I don't know if we'll get out, but we still have 45 minutes or so, so maybe. Still trying. <laughs> so I would add this angle of trauma. Has another angle. Let's go with where is it? Richard Grant in one of his classic ones, or two of these. This is another angle of trauma. I like this because it's pithy and it's very simple. The opening. The trauma is when you realize that nobody gives a fuck. Nobody gives a fuck. The trauma is when you realize that nobody gives a fuck. Nobody gives a fuck. Because if you're broken and you get exiled, when you get exiled, no one gives a fuck. You have cooties. So when people come to the group and they cry trauma, if there's no one that's saying fuck you, insulting them, getting reactive to them, it's probably not big trauma. It's little t trauma, using Claudia B's pointers. Because <laughs> you might have the deep injury, you might feel helpless and hopeless, but if you don't have society, you don't have people socially exiling you, you don't have people saying it's all you and they're they're not listening to your trauma. It's not lingering trauma yet. You're pissed off at it. You can have the traumatic injury, but you don't really have PTSD trauma until you're broken in exile. How did Richard Granning get broken in exile? Ah. Uh, oh shit. So I went through this breakup. My friends didn't care. Nobody gives a family didn't care. I couldn't pay a psychologist to care. Nobody I did pay psychologists to care. Some of them laughed at me, literally. So, so if you have people laughing at your trauma, then you might have trauma. 
if you don't have people laughing at your face and therapists laughing at your face or shutting you down, you might not have full-blown trauma. That's just a pity story, which is fine, needs healing, <laughs> but hyperbolically calling trauma and abuse and all this stuff, <laughs> if you don't have the social world saying you're broken and exiled and shunning you, then you have another problem, but trauma is where you lose touch with society. You lose touch with society like Robbie's son who wants to kill himself because he can't fit in. He doesn't find a social place because he's taken on the negative identity from the grandmother and the brokenness. That's how I'm going to try to define trauma for today's purposes. All of those layers of trauma are actually coming from the external world being so different. Nobody gives a fuck from the reality that you know in your core to be true, that mm. you have to hold on your own. This part, you have to hold it on your own. That is a trauma. <laughs> it is isolating. You feel broken because the external world cannot feel your pain because pain feels real to the person who feels it. Hyper real. And to everyone who's witnessing, they can have doubt because they can't feel your pain. They can project feeling your pain, but they can't. For trauma, trauma is isolating, individuating, separating. It's a potential initiation, but he's right here. So he is accurate there. Here's some more examples. That you mm. have to hold on your own. That mm. you have to hold on your own. It feels like everything is gaslighting you. Yeah. But how do we, how do we quantify that? You know, how do we know that we're not the ones that are just fucking crazy? Which is the problem with this kind of gaslighting. If you're constantly, constantly having your view of reality chipped away at, constantly any reasonable intelligent person must ask the question, maybe it's me, maybe it's me. Because if you don't, you're psychotic. So you have trauma. Everybody else is reflecting that you have cooties or doesn't believe you. Or if you tell your story, they might believe you, but they're, they're trying to pacify you so they feel good. They don't even see you. Then it's easy for you to start thinking that it's you. That you're broken and exiled. Because a psychological injury could probably be addressed, but because of the social rejection injury, being broken and exiled, no one gives a fuck. No, actually the trauma is when you realize that nobody gives a fuck. No, actually the trauma is when you realize that nobody gives a fuck. No, actually the trauma is when you realize that nobody gives a fuck. No. This social exile is confusing because therapists will do the same thing to you because they also respond to trauma with a one-two. I don't know how to. So one, you're disturbing me, and two, you're making me feel incompetent. Fuck you. I don't know how to. So one, you're disturbing me, and two, you're making me feel incompetent. Fuck you. I don't know. If you share your trauma too strongly, too unfiltered, beyond the capacity for your therapist or healer to feel competent, they're going to get traumatized by your fucked up trauma and they're going to attack you or smother you or dump toxic shame on you. That's the unspoken rules of the trauma game, unfortunately. And this is just one opinion, so if it doesn't match for you, there's tons of other experts you can digest. So. And there's some time I'll try to present alternative if I get to it. <laughs> so they just see you and they're like, oh, dude, him getting affected by her? Nobody gets a real. Okay. Okay, Mr. Life Coach. The life coach is getting coached. Oh. Yes, the narcissism life coach is going to a therapist because he got into a narcissistic abuse relationship and the therapist laughed at him. <laughs>
didn't believe it. Okay. And and that's kind of like what the, the, the world was kind of telling you, I feel. Yeah. The trauma is when you realize that nobody gives a fuck. Nobody gives a fuck. So then here's some more details about the therapist that said, fuck you to him. But if somebody's saying this in their emotional dysregulation and they're up and they're down and they're there and they're there, da, 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 what a lot of clinicians will do is go fucking hell, they'll recoil because they're horrified, they're disturbed. This is what psychiatrists and nurses and counselors and therapists don't want to tell you is you, you disturb them because they're people. It's disturbing. I get disturbed. That's why I don't want to do coaching with people. Anymore. He gets disturbed too, because that's the nature of trauma. If you're so unregulated or you're going to hyper rage states and hyper depressed states, and you're just flipping all over the place, people can't make sense of you. So you, your existence traumatizes other people. If you have your narcissism story and then you just want to start flooding the first person and you're in a grab and say, listen to me and let me tell you my trauma story and loop in front of your face for an hour. That's traumatizing to the person that you're talking to. You are not regulated. You are not in the zone of regulation. Which, there. So. You're not in the optimal was window of tolerance. You're getting hyper aroused and rage is coming out unpredictably. And then you're getting hypo aroused where you'll go into sad, frozen baby and you just flip all over the place. Because you don't have a normal window of tolerance because you had an injury that messed up your nervous system of how to regulate. So you reach out to other people to help regulate. That's what we're supposed to do. <laughs> but if you have a fucked up family in a childhood, you don't know how to reach out to people. You don't have people you trust. So when you finally get someone that you trust, you flood them or they flood you and you have a dual mothership and enmeshment or something and it's lovely, but eventually it crashes because <laughs> not being not having an optimal window of tolerance, not having a wide enough self-regulation, you traumatize people. But I have the honesty to say, I don't like doing it. I find it disturbing. When you're faced with raw emotion at that level, it's, it's quite frightening and it, it doesn't feel very nice. And it, it, it's also contagious uh, and they don't want it. So it's a kind of a shunning. So it's also contagious. So if you're stuck in trauma mode, you're stuck in a state of overwhelm and maybe pure terror or fear. And normal people don't want to feel afraid. People might come into this group and say, oh, I feel afraid because of this. I'm triggered. People don't like feeling afraid. <laughs> people don't like feeling raw terror. People don't like feeling flooded and overwhelmed. So what do they do? They shun in exile, like he's saying. He even said when he was coaching, he didn't like coaching people that were traumatized and flooding. This is just human nature. This is the rules of the game. We reject people that are too weird and flooding. Well, society shuns people who are too traumatized. This is the norm. Why do we shun people who are too so traumatized? So it's kind of a shunning. They go, oh, I don't want to do it. No, thank you. No, thank you. So you have manic depressive disorder, take this lithium, you have borderline personality You have this disorder. label, you, schizophrenic you have that label. Because I just don't label. want to deal with the, the this that you're presenting me with. And, I, and quite frankly, I don't know how to. So one, you're disturbing me. And two, you're making me feel incompetent. Fuck you. So two, you're making me feel incompetent. So if trauma is where you get overwhelmed with an injury, a psychological injury, is a traumatized person feeling incompetent? <laughs> They've been overwhelmed. They're feeling helpless. They can't cope. Most likely, they're feeling rather incompetent. Trauma and incompetence might be the same emotion, right? <laughs> so if you're traumatized and you flood your therapist or friend with incompetence, because you feel incompetent because you're traumatized and your therapist or coach or somebody else does not 
like feeling incompetent, how much space are they going to hold for trauma? <laughs> Even if they're saying, oh, I love you and I'm cuddling and they're all sugary and sweet nonsense. If they have defenses against feeling incompetent, once you flood them with your emotions of feeling incompetent, they will defend against incompetence and attack you with these, like with this one too. Here. How to? So one, you're disturbing me and two, you're making me feel incompetent. Fuck you. Not just fuck you. A lot of times people say, flip it. You're traumatized. You need to rescue me. <laughs> I'm the most broken person in the world. So now I want, <laughs> I'm having to rescue somebody else <laughs> when I have the bigger trauma because the person with the lesser trauma has better language because <laughs> they're less traumatized. <laughs> so they can shame me <laughs> and shun me and force me to shut down and cave and feel more broken because that's the unspoken rules of the game. Unfortunately. So how do I get out of this? Mm -hmm. So if you continue with the normal path, you shrink and decay. Because when you share your trauma, people will reflect back to you that you're broken. Or you need to fix this, you need to fix this, you gotta cope this, you gotta do that. They end up making you so busy at trying to manage your symptoms, you shrink. Are they helping you grow the capacity to deal with intensity? Are they helping you to grow the capacity to get exposure, to face your demons, to get stronger and change? Or are they trying to get you to not break down again? Or are they trying to cover you up with affirmations or other stuff like that? So how do I illustrate this? Okay, since we're using Richard Grannon, <laughs> this was from this week or a couple of days ago. I'm not a fan of revisiting trauma. I think it's a... So the question is, could it be that revisiting your trauma is not not healthy, or could that be used for healing? I would argue that revisiting the trauma is essential because the reason why you're traumatized is because you feel helpless until you deal with your helplessness, integrate it, you're just screwed. But let's see his argument. Or does he make one? Or does it make no sense? Bordering on a superstition, um, if I'm being uncharitable, if I'm being charitable, uh a misunderstanding, a common misconception of how re resolution from trauma occurs. He says there is a common misconception. Where is the evidence? Let's see. Recollection, revisiting, re-experiencing. What, what's the evidence that that's going to create healing if it was painful? Tons of evidence, because that's called memory reconsolidation. <laughs> Tons of research papers. All he's doing is sowing doubt, shitting on other people's trauma so far. But let's see if there's any other argument he's making. Does he look confident in his stance of saying that you don't need to? <laughs> Healing, if it was painful the first time, why wouldn't it be painful the tenth time? Because that's the memory. <laughs> if you froze during the first trauma and you felt 10% of the pain, if you revisit it, you might feel 80% of the pain. So yes, it will hurt. It will be flooding. It will be trauma. But if you don't feel it now or later, it'll just keep haunting you the rest of your life. So you're in this frozen avoidance state that his body is in right here, but he's not saying because he brainwashes himself using dismissal. Because dismissal is a very strong response. It's a good defense. 
allows you to dump your shit all over onto other people and be oblivious about it. Unless you're doing exposure therapy, which is a very specific... Oh, here's unless. Exposure therapy. ...structured methodology that very few people are actually using correctly. <laughs> There's a very structured way to do exposure therapy. You can't just expose because that's too sloppy. Um, but other than that, no, you don't, you don't need to revisit it, in my humble opinion. In my not humble opinion. Not humble. <laughs> he owns that. With no evidence. Limited evidence. I probably know what I'm doing with this stuff. Look at the confidence in his eyes. He probably knows what he's doing. Does he look like he knows what he's probably. doing? Probably. Bro! Look at that certainty. Yeah. Or is he dissociated? How grounded is he in this state? Yeah. I think he's ah. just looking at it, but he's putting shit out there. Now this was uh, two, two and a half years earlier. Richard Grannon's answer. And the the uh, the truth is that you always need a kind of exposure therapy. So, does he look more grounded here than he did in the prior video? Does he look more relaxed in this state versus the last one where he's shifty and whatnot? I would. Or is he just drugged out both times? That is reasonable. Sure. <laughs> develop it the ability and then I go out and use it and then I get burnt and it, it hurts and it's risky um, but over time with repetition you build calluses and you build the skill of it um, it's not there are no there are no cerebral solutions to this it's an action thing you have to do it and you're Brain, your brain's not stupid you can't just NLP it and go oh you're confident now because your brain will be like no, we're not. <laughs> That's nonsense. <laughs> you have to build uh, reference experiences over time, and um, it does take time. It does take effort. It's uh, it's not not an easy process, but very very rewarding. Extremely rewarding. R Richard, is grit a good word for that? Sorry, is grit a good word for that? Yeah, you need well, you will need grit. Question. You will need a, a work <laughs> ethic, and you need to be clear in your intent, like. Um, if you want to be more social and you want to speak to more people, you need to have that as a very, very clear intent. And then don't let yourself off the hook. That means at the supermarket, that means when you... And it also means you need to be in a group that doesn't smother you, that doesn't give you excuses when things are traumatizing, that doesn't rescue you from the intensity because if you want to heal trauma, you have to integrate those memories. If you don't revisit it, what's your out? Are you going to take the SGB injection? Someone try that and report back to me. Stellate, ganglet, something. Are you going to use some other chemicals so you don't have to remember? Even if you do ayahuasca and LSD, you're going to have a trip that's sort of reintegrated. This goes back to that memory. You're walking down the street that means all the time if you want to be more sociable and you want to be more extroverted you've got to be practicing all the time okay let's follow that don't let yourself off the hook can we stay on that point sure the unconscious argument that codependents almost Already hang out with this. other codependents Oops. who constantly <laughs> let people off the hook yeah when we let ourselves Have off the hook that? it's it's um codependency probably um I suspect comes from being parentified as a child, uh, which means you've you've experienced some emotional incest, probably from a parent with quite highly narcissistic traits, where they forced you to act in a role that wasn't appropriate for a child. I see. Where dodging the you question. basically became their parent or their confidant, which means that your modality from childhood for interacting with others is self-sacrificing and <clears throat> false. It's rooted in role playing. Um, which makes it very difficult as an adult to form authentic bonds with people because you never show up. You're Why is he letting the people off the hook? That was my fucking question. <laughs> you see how he's letting the codependents off the hook by saying, oh, you're broken, you grew up with all this other shit. You're fucking enabling other people <laughs> by smothering them. By being self-protective and not letting them, not giving them the courage, not encourage them. 
encouraging them to heal their trauma, to face their helplessness, to not be fucking broken. You're enabling shrinking decay. Okay, here's audio. I think it got too difficult, really, for me to pretend to be normal. I just couldn't do it anymore. Part of me wishes I could have <laughs> just pretended like everything was okay and I could be the high-performing badass that everyone thought I was, and I just could not. So this is her complaint and my complaint a lot, seeing people going through grief and trauma, that people who are uncomfortable holding space for your trauma or your grief will give you cheerleading euphemisms and platitudes. Maybe even saying you're healed, and then they expect you to be thankful for the worthless platitudes. <laughs> so you end up having to pretend and hide your trauma. So you're not growing the capacity to share and integrate your trauma. You're having assholes, cheerleaders, dismissers, sh reinforce shrinking and decay. They're not encouraging you, challenging you, holding you accountable to yourself. And they're not giving you the space to even do it. They're actually making you pretend. They're trying to push you to be a still fawn self. It's not just you. It's the environment that's pushing you to keep pretending. And once I admitted that to myself and said, you know, I might not be that person, but here's who I am instead. That's when life got a lot easier, <laughs> more comfortable. And yeah, that's when my tribe came along and everyone was like, oh, us too. Yeah. And prove that there is a different way to, to live this life that is just as valuable and just as viable. Yeah. Yes, if you're lucky enough and you're socialized enough, maybe you can find a tribe that can hold some of your pain. I would argue that if this is too easy, then it's probably not your full trauma. But you get re-socialized, so it might be good enough. Yeah, and how much easier it gets when you stop pretending to be something you're not feeling. Yeah. And also understanding that it has to be safe enough to do that, right? Like, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of sort of like, what's the pop psychology headline version of that is like speak your truth claim your power well it's not always safe to do that yeah i mean i had to burn down my whole life to be able to do it yeah basically i lost everything and i was like well i have nothing left to lose so i might as well do this sometimes it takes that rock bottom until you have nothing to lose why would you take the risk of creating a new social self or just blowing everything up <laughs> People are always like, yeah, the bravery thing. People are like, oh, you're so brave to have like shared your story. And I was like, there was nothing to lose anymore. So there was no, nothing yeah. brave about it. <laughs> I have literally tried everything else possible. And now there is nothing. And this is the only option left for me. So my argument is that if you can find a community or a therapist, or a friend, or peer that can help you grow capacity that will not shrink and decay in the face of trauma, in the face of your trauma, it will not freak the fuck out and try to smother you, that will challenge you to keep growing and reflect back to you, to, back to you reality and the path towards reality, then maybe you don't have to hit rock bottom. Probably you still have to hit pretty close to rock bottom. Why would you care? Why would you openly accept the pain? Now we're running out of time. I had more time earlier. Who's lost? Who's following? Who's traumatized? <laughs> I was supposed to open up with these things. 
Okay, let's go here. <laughs> if we need something for the most part to calm us down, if we're feeling something overwhelming, we instantly have to do an action to bring our system down. It's a big indication that the system doesn't know how to self-regulate because if we do know how to self-regulate at that autonomic nervous system level, then we don't have to think it because autonomic nervous system means automatic. It just happens. It just happens. A big part of this work is gaining obviously the education, the capacity, the skills, the mastery to actually be with the real intense stuff, real intense stuff and not calm it down. Nothing wrong with you. So if you do not grow the capacity to be with discomfort, to be with intensity, to be with your emotion, that's not healing. If you've had a traumatizing experience, which is a flood of emotions that's overwhelmed you, that's intense. If it's intense and now you're broken and you have less capacity to be with intensity, until you can be with intensity, you're not healed. And if you're not making any progress of being with intensity and discomfort and triggers, you're not doing anything. And that'll get to the face part, which <laughs> I might need to rush through, but <laughs> it's really simple, but our society is so avoidant building and we focus so much on coping to get away from the pain, to get away from the emotion because we have terror of negative emotions. This is codependency, ladies and gentlemen. It is a neurotic drive, no choice, no freedom to serve to serve, to submit, to fawn, to supplicate. It is a terror of negative emotions in yourself and in others. But if you have a terror of negative emotions and you're a slave, then you can't wake up because... The pain makes him wake up. The pain makes him wake up. The pain makes him wake up. The but if we're trying to cope all the time... What we're trying to do is mask pain. We're trying to mask vulnerability. What we're trying to do is mask pain. We're trying to mask vulnerability. What we're trying to do is mask pain. We're trying to mask vulnerability. What we're trying to do is mask pain. We're trying to mask vulnerability. What that is not healing. That is shaming your pain, which you can do and it works, but it you shrink. You don't have the capacity to deal with intensity, you don't have the capacity to deal with normal highs and lows of emotional expression. You ultimately need to have somebody that can sit with you. And like her, sometimes human beings have to just sit in one place and like her and like her, sometimes human beings have to just sit in one place and like her and like That's where, you, <laughs> in this chart, if you hit fight or flight to reaching freeze, where you're feeling helpless, see, there's actually helplessness right here. Was that Adam's uh, input, right? See, so you're feeling helpless, you're feeling numb, depressed, dissociated, your dorsal vagal has put you in a hyper arousal life threat state. Then you get shamed and you get shut down and exiled from your social peers. And you're just trapped in this state of frozen trauma. Then as you get out of the state of frozen trauma, your rage at the world and your rage at injustices takes you over. So you go down from frozen into fight or flight. So rage comes up here. And then people judge you and stop you here. So now you're in this sort of lovely up and down zigzag roller coaster <laughs> where you spend your life chasing after healing. And then everyone tells you, 
fix this, fix that, fix that, and it's just, it should be more chaotic, but <laughs> you're in this in-between of freeze and fight flight. An ongoing fear response. And every time you share your fear too much, other people feel incompetent, and they ultimately smother you, judge you, stomp on your throat, because that's the scapegoating game. We look for the person who has more trauma, and then unconsciously we can dump our trauma on them if we're a little higher in the regulation zone. That's colonization. America's history. That's a political thing, and you might get into dangerous territory. <laughs> using some strategies and external resources but my interest here and what i do when i work with my students is to help them gain the foundation and the capacity to be with the intensities be with the intensities be with the intensities slowly over time so they can learn this new language of nervous system regulation so they can in fact wake up in the morning and just go about their day without needing these things to get through their day. So it's a muscle of being with intensity, which comes through exposure <laughs> and practice and nervous system tending. It's a muscle you build. If every time you get re-triggered, you run away, you're building the muscle of running away which is this magic chart. So, How many people have heard of the three Fs, fight, flight, and freeze? And how many people like the fawn part, which I think is totally stupid, but fuck Pete Walker. And he can come and face me if he wants to argue his fucking fawn. <laughs> I invite him and Richard Granin to face me, and anybody else who wants to worship fawn as a fourth. F. <laughs> so if these are the four responses to fear, okay, and if you, when you feel, when you're traumatized, you're in a state of frozen fear, fear. <laughs> your fear is frozen, immobilized, <laughs> and then when you want to get into the society, your fear is mobilized. What does that mean? That means your fear melts. And now you feel the terror in real time. And when you feel the terror and fear in real time, you are contagious. You make other people feel terrified. And when you make other people feel terrified, they're going to respond with the four Fs. Fight, flight, or freeze. What usually happens? So you can attack the messenger, <laughs> insult, blame, mistreat, that's fighting. You can flight, so you can avoid, dismiss, deny, hide, sabotage when you see fear coming. Or you can freeze, so you can just shut down, justify, rationalize, intellectualize, comply. Or you can face the emotion of connection, the opposite of shame. This is what empathy is supposed to be. This is what compassion is supposed to be, facing fears. Facing fears is defending what matters, standing up for some values. It's the opposite of pussy space that Pankaj is trying to keep calling out for some stupid reason. <laughs> this is a space of holding space because it's about preserving and mitigating. So if you have someone that joins you next to you and helps you face your trauma, that's what's missing. They're helping you face your fear based on this chart. Mobilize the fear, welcome the fear, welcome the rage, welcome whatever, and then that'll deactivate it and bring you back into the green.
But if your therapist does not know how to face fear, and that's probably why they got into therapy, because they can't handle terror and fear and they're fucked up. That Why else would someone want to be a damn therapist and listen to people's fucked up stories every day and get paid for it? That's a horrific job. Only emotional perverts would want to be therapists. Or not, not all, but most, okay. <laughs> so you need someone who's initiated, who can face the fear. If they help you face your fear, then it's like, bring whatever rage and terror to me, and then I'll just say, oh, okay, it's boring. <laughs> oh, it's in the past. Oh, join the party. You also got beat up that way. Whatever. That neutralizes the terror <laughs> that you can come back down <laughs> into the green zone, the ventral vagal blah blah, whatever they call <laughs> the healthy state. But if you're around narcissist uh, coaches, they'll give you this thing. They'll try to teach avoidance, which is what? Shut down or denial. I'll give you an example. So he abandoned you. You're 30. So this is the question. Someone's 30. Dad discarded 20 years ago. Discarded him or her. Dad wants to come back. And then dad maybe wants to see the daughter. So this anteater guy or girl got discarded 20 years ago by the dad and the dad wants to come back now and it's asking Lee Hammock and Kate Stand or whatever her name is <laughs> if it's safe to let them in what kind of answer will they give? Will it be facing flight, flight or freeze? <laughs> he, he left you when you are 10 is it safe to come back in? Well, I mean, is he a narcissist? Because if he is, then no, he's probably back. That's all you have. If he's a narcissist, then no, yes. <laughs> Just black and white, that simple. Who cares if your daughter wants to know the grandfather? <laughs> to, like, get something or ask for money or something. Unless he's coming back, like, with a ton of remorse and, like, went on some discovery journey and learned what he did and, like, just feels so bad and, like, had no other choice or was going through something, you know, there's not really a good reason to abandon. If he came back and he was love bombing like that, that sounds like a narcissist. <laughs> Your kids. It's hurtful. It's really hurtful. And I think it'll probably be hurt. It's hurtful for him. It's not hurtful for the doctor. And you don't know yet with this question having him back especially if you have a young child mm -hmm. uh, imagine them discarding getting getting involved with your uh, daughter and then discarding them after a couple of weeks or a couple of years whatever what we you, when your daughter is right there you know what i mean yeah. it's be paranoid maybe he's going to come back and abandon your daughter or granddaughter how dare that happen it's hurtful uh, yeah you don't understand and she the grandchild yeah she doesn't need or he doesn't need to feel that way yeah, right here. I'm going to put this over. Look, there's an answer from Visceral Gravitas. What does he say? Let him prove himself. The gall of using the word prove. <laughs> Inside joke. <laughs> with changed behavior patterns over time. Does Lee agree with my proving point? Right, this is good. Let him prove himself. With ch uh, change behavior, y'all. If you're going to allow that, is consistent change behavior and take the relationship off. The I, I would take the relationship off the table. What does prove yourself with change behavior mean? That's saying... We're not just blindly accepting the self-report of the examinee. We're not just blindly accepting the self-report of the examinee. We're not just blindly accepting the self-report of the examinee. We're not just... This is everybody. This is also yourself. Don't accept the blind report that you're telling yourself. We're not just blindly accepting the self-report of the examinee. We're not just blindly accepting the self-report of the examinee. Unless you're trying to gaslight yourself, which is okay. 
I will perfect yeah. gaslighting me. Gaslighting me. I will perfect yeah. gaslighting me. But I gaslighting reckon me. Though. We're not just blindly accepting the self report of the examinee. We're not just blindly accepting the self report of the examinee. We're not just blindly accepting the self report of the examinee. We're What's the time? Nine. Okay. So if, if it's this simple, facing instead of flight, flight or freeze, that's all you have to slowly build up to take action <laughs> and get exposure to face your fears, face your triggers. We watch videos of you facing your triggers, going to environments that are uncomfortable to face your triggers. So you neutralize your terror. And I, if you can't do it yourself, then you have other people. Find other people that can join you in facing your terrors. Or they're holding the ground. So they're defending your walls in attunement with you, staying connected in dual attunement or therapy attunement, unconscious therapeutic alliances, all the different pointers they have, of having someone that can stay connected with you and your emotions so you can dysregulate. But if you don't want to trust a therapist, you don't want to trust someone else to dysregulate, then good luck trying to face anything. Probably not going to happen. So, it's hard to get examples of facing emotions. So we use facing physical dangers, because it's the same emotion, or same fear, but a little easier to capture. So this is how some people are successful at facing big fears, what they talk about. Uh, I think fear is something I've learned to live with a lot. I think you're not human if you don't feel a little bit kind of you know, nervous when you're dealing with big, you know, crocodiles and snakes or free climbs or big rivers or whatever. I still find it hard sometimes and then it's just I take that time to stop, breathe a little bit, assess it, go, no, we're good, we're solid here, and then carry on. I don't think you ever overcome your fear. I think you could just manage it because fear isn't a bad thing. Fear is what keeps you alive, you know. So it's something you manage. It's not something you try to destroy. That would be the fight approach something you face and manage. That's what I'm trying to promote as a missing link for trauma. Fear is what tells you, dude, this is totally dangerous, man. You got to watch out and get on your A-game. You know, the ability to channel your fear, it gets it gets a little more difficult because out of all those years, you end up becoming more knowledgeable of uh, how much dirt hurts. If anything, I think, you know, you want an alliance with fear. You know, if you kind of break down what it is, the root. Alliance with fear. That's working with fear. A fear, essentially, it's the unknown, the what if. I've learned to get used to it. I don't think it gets any easier, but I've also learned to try and use it as an emotion that's there just to sharpen me for what I've got to do. You can't let the fear overcome you. You want to manage it to a point where you know something is dangerous. You know you've got to like change what you're doing to kind of adapt to your environment. But if your fear is overcoming you, then you're not going to be able to manage your body and do the right moves that will take you to the good, happy place at the end. I often find that if you look at something and you break it down into parts and pieces that individually aren't really fearful. My advice would just be to, to try and scare yourself at least once a day. It's things like that that makes you feel alive. At least once a day, learn to enjoy feeling alive. But at the same time, the more you do it, the better you are at controlling your fear. And the more you do it. Now that's a more dramatic version. This is a simpler version, but this is a harder lesson. I, I feel as I expressed because I need... Oops. I desire. I feel as I expressed because I need respect and acknowledgement, and I need to be able to feel safe in my job environment. I hear needs in there. Yes. 
Uh, this is Marshall Rosenberg, the founder of NBC Nonviolent Communication. He uses hand puppets. Because, uh, <laughs> but he does. When you do what I described, I feel as I express because I need to express my desire and need without it hurting you. No, no, no. Now no? we got a bunch of stuff. Oh, shoot. <laughs> if you want to avoid hurting other people, the only way I can offer you to do that is to become a nice dead person. <laughs> yeah. Because if other people have jackal ears, they can get hurt if you have heartburn. So if you need to tiptoe around anybody's interpretation, that's current uh, impact over intention. If you have to go massage your language for any potential microaggression for one potential trigger of somebody, you've destroyed your ability for language. You can't be responsible for that. So would I just cut off that second half? Just. I need to express my desire and need? Yes, and then, I, and then what you want to say to yourself, and I want to learn to enjoy your pain. Ooh. That's part of facing fear. Learning to enjoy other people's pain because having sympathy and pity for other people is a wasted emotion, which Kurt has observed and known about by seeing that in the death industry. But feeling bad for someone else, or thinking you feel bad is going to change other people, is the same energy of wasted pity. Whoa, Which is, we're enjoy. going to show you after lunch how to enjoy the other person's pain. Ooh, that sounds... It's one of the most loving things you can do, you see. If you, as I will define it, obviously, I don't mean in a sadistic way. I, yeah. So sometimes facing feels like sadistic joy because you're facing somebody enduring their fear and their pain and you're letting it happen. You're not getting in the way of their fucking experience. You're not making it about you and your tolerance or intolerance of pain by jumping in there and smothering or rescuing somebody. You're witnessing holding space for someone else to collapse or someone else to stand up and finally face their fears and conquer it. You can't control what's going to happen. That's their life experience. You get in the way, then it's about you. But unfortunately, that's what they're teaching now. With performative activism. This one. Yeah. I'm very allergic to performative activism now. <laughs> right. Yelling for other people to do the work for yeah. you. Performative activism now. <laughs> right. And I used to do yeah. it. Like, I get yeah, it. So. I totally <laughs> yeah. get it. It's not that I think this person's bad or stupid. It's just after going through the legislative process and seeing what is necessary, what actually needs to be done, I can't do the, like, <laughs> performative yeah. outrage on Instagram mm. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I'm reminded of the first month of Ukraine. All these people were doing slogans and getting angry at Ukraine, and somehow it seemed like they thought their anger would somehow make Russia and Putin stop. Uh, where was the fucking logic there? People are still trying to think their cheerleading or hate against Russia is going to have any impact on the war. But they got tired of hating it because nothing happened, and that's... In reality, sometimes people need to take action. You can't just fucking yell and scream and throw pity and hate stuff and have someone else do the work, especially for your trauma. Formative outrage, you know, without some kind of action behind yeah. it. And that's why I won't normally comment on things unless I'm actively doing something if I've got my fingers in the dirt. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just like you're still just like yelling for other people to do the work for yeah. you. Yelling for other people to do the work for yeah. you. I think people really have to wake up to the fact that no one's going to do it for you. Mm -hmm. No one's going to do it for you. Mm -hmm. And if you're upset about it, like you have to get on the ground. Like you actually have a lot more power than you realize. And that's what this. You have to get on the ground. You have to be grounded. You have to find your power before you can even do anything. 
you're just floating disconnected in your delusion and then you just target anybody who reminds you of reality too much that's giving your power away to them to try to somehow heal you it's taught me is that we do have more power we just haven't been taught how to use it we've been purposely that's disempowered great. and they they <laughs> rely on you know, us putting up a black square mm. or like wearing an armband or something and being like, I did it, yeah. you know, yeah. and it's like, that's not it. That is a Lazy. very, very Lazy small ethics. piece of a very big yeah. puzzle. And it takes work and it takes and education. Time. It's going to take away from your life. It will take away from your it family. Will it will take away from things that you would rather mm -hmm. be doing. It will be painful. Or you can yell at videos. What the hell did his dad ruin? He was bullying his yeah, girlfriend. This he video. wouldn't leave her alone. Like, what? I'm angry. How many people see <laughs> Alex tantruming at this guy who's not even in the room? Yeah. That's at least two. There's five. I, five I, people I, I see, see it. Six. And my daughter seven. sees it. There's hi. seven people seeing hi. you, Alex, tantruming hi. at this guy who's hi. not in this room. Say hi. So if you're gifted enough that you can watch a video and you get triggered, then you have instant material to work on every single night. <laughs> you don't even need a trauma therapist. You can just keep watching whatever the fuck that's triggering you and just keep giving yourself exposure and journal about it. I'm not so gifted. I have to go actively search for triggers <laughs> to test myself, and then I can re-expose and integrate it. I don't have all these free, easy triggers that you can do. Or that other people apparently seem to have. So that's an advantage. So back to learning how to face pain. This is high level Qigong master skill, which I don't know if you guys will be able to use, but, or anybody, but this is a pointer of how to hold space for pain. And if you want to do it faster, it requires this kind of humor or this kind of attitude. I have a friend of mine who used to be a really top Chinese doctor, Qigong Tui Na therapist. And one of the things about Qigong Tui Na is that they can do these miraculous healings. And there are two ways it can be done. One way is you two can ways. do it so the problem will be over the soonest. And very often that is going to cause you so much pain while it's being done to you. You would scream. Not to mention you probably be telling the therapist you hope he's dropped in a vat of acid next week. The pain can be intense. But yet, at the end, what that's going to mean is that you're going to be through the problem. And what my friend always did, which I always thought was kind of cute, and I saw many other Qigong Twina doctors who did it, is... So this is the kind of boundaries you need if you really want to help people with trauma or heavy pains. This type of boundaries is that the more a person started screaming, the more they started laughing. They took the chi they were absorbing into their body from that person, and they just used it to have a good old time and a good old laugh. Because some people would say, well, they should feel the pain they're causing this person. Why? So it's better two people are suffering than one? If you really look at that, that... It's not just that. Some people maladaptive abuser types might actively invite other people to feel the pain for them because they don't want to feel the pain. So I will play as a pretend victim or I will not work on my capacity to hold pain and I will get other people to feel my pain for me. Or I don't know any different. This is what I learned from my parents, this sort of hot potato transfer the pain game. So then this is how I maintain containment by dysregulating and then getting other people to feel my pain. And what's the boundary that he's saying? You have to hold space and laugh at that. It really doesn't make any sense. So try in this time to find a source, find something inside you that will allow you to laugh at things that are miserable. Dissolve inside of you what is stopping you from laughing when things are getting miserable. Because just remember, you can scream, 
with as much pain as you want, but I seriously doubt it's going to stop the sun from rising and falling. So although this is something a human ego will like to do, if you can have intelligence, why don't you just maybe choose not to hurt as much? Or maybe sometimes codependents are trying to hurt as rescuing someone else, so that's a way to displace the hurt and project on it to somebody else, to titrate it. But then you don't get the healing because you're dealing with someone else's hurt, and somehow you think that's going to come back to your integrating you. So this goes back to the end of last meeting, and we'll close on that. Have you the courage to see what you're seeing? Have you the courage to see what you're seeing? Have you the courage to see what you're seeing? And then this is a larger clip, two minutes, to add some context. Perfect. What about Bangladesh? What about Africa? What about tyranny? What about violence? What about greed? He's, oh, he's, don't you see it's all perfect? Can't you step back for a moment from your humanity to see the way of things? Can't you see the way it's all lawfully unfolding? The question is, have you the courage to see what you're seeing? Or does it seem to take away your humanity? This is not easy. <laughs> this is sort of more a fatalistic point of view, but this is this place of unconditional love and living under grace. Have you the courage to take it out of your hands? Yes, it feels good to sit in judgment of the whole world and think you know better, but that's a big burden to take on. You want to police the world and make sure you don't get triggered, whatever, that's heavy. So the spiritual path is you have to see the perfection in the world and then you can work within reality. Work within grace, see the miracles that can be worked within that perfection. But it's painful because your humanity can get agonized. Because when you look and you say it's all perfect, the problem is it's so impersonal. Somebody falls down in front of you and you say, karma. See, there's no warmth to it. But if you come down into your human heart, the pain is unbearable because there is so much suffering everywhere. And you look and that there's rape and there's child molestation and there's ecological insensitivity and there's tyranny and there's terrorism and there's... Which one is it first? Starvation, the homeless. The, who is it? Where's, where does your heart go first? And what most people do is they close their heart down and they armor it to protect it from the immense amount of suffering. They armor it with their mind, with thoughts, with a web or a net or a veil of thought that armors the heart so that they don't get hurt and overwhelmed by the immensity of the suffering. The so they armor up. He's saying they're armoring up and he's judging people for their defenses of flight and fight. I'm arguing to build the muscle of facing it. And laughing at it. It's not your job. Put it in God's hand. Blame the devil. Blame the archons. Why are you taking on the sufferings of the world as your problem? You must have a savior complex. Go for it. Have fun. <laughs> it will cripple you like arrows to your back. Heart has no boundaries. My heart goes out to you is the expression. The heart will give. The heart doesn't know boundaries. The mind knows the boundaries. The heart says, here, take my automobile, take my apartment, take anything. And so this armoring protects not only our hearts from the amount of suffering outside, but it protects our separateness from our heart, which would give away our separateness. It would give away everything. <laughs> Richard Gannon talks about that. He's talked about that. I'm not sure about giving away stuff because your heart is so open. But maybe I'm Chinese. Or I don't, maybe I'm fucked up. <laughs> 
too thrifty. Okay, we went over a little because I wanted to cover some of facing your pain. Have you the courage to see what you're seeing? Have you the courage to see what you're seeing? Have you the courage to see what you're seeing? And that requires you to face reality. That's same pointer. <laughs> if you're looking away, <laughs> you're not seeing reality. If you're digging your head into the sand and freezing, you're not seeing reality. If you're fighting and judging all the injustices of the world, you're not seeing reality. Do you have the courage to face reality and build that muscle through repeated exposure of facing reality again and again and again? Is it this simple? Aniakan has spoken. Okay, I'm done. Aniakan has spoken. Okay, I'm done. That is fucking terrifying. That is fucking terrifying. That is fucking terrifying.